today is a special day because we are celebrating Women's Health Month. It is a time to reflect on how far we have come in understanding and addressing women's unique health needs, but also a moment to honestly assess how much further we need to go, especially when it comes to medical research and clinical care. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Kara Wada. I am a board-certified allergy, immunology, lifestyle, and functional medicine physician, a certified life coach, and I have dedicated over 15 years to helping people navigate the often confusing world of allergies, asthma, autoimmunity, and mast cell disorders. As someone who lives with Sjogren's disease and autoimmune condition myself, I also intimately understand the journey of having a condition that doesn't always neatly fit into a textbook definition doesn't always click all those boxes. As both a physician and someone living with autoimmune disease, this conversation isn't just professional for me, it's deeply personal. So grab a cup of tea or water, coffee, get comfortable, and let's dive in to why women's health deserves our focused attention, not just this month, but every day of the year. To understand where we are today, we need to acknowledge our history. Did you know that for nearly two decades, from 1977 until 1993, the FDA effectively banned most women of childbearing potential from participating in early phase clinical trials? This decision was made with protective intentions in mind following what happened with thalidomide in the 1950s and 60s, where a medication that was prescribed for morning sickness caused severe birth defects. This primarily was outside of the U.S., but we responded, and this is how we responded. And while this concern was maybe understandable at the time, this solution had far-reaching consequences. It created a massive knowledge gap that we are still working to overcome today. Imagine developing medications where half the population isn't represented in the research. And that's exactly what happened. In 1993, the FDA finally reversed this guideline, and in 1994, the NIH mandated the inclusion of women in federally funded clinical research. Now, these were important steps forward, but progress has been slower than many hoped. Even today, women remain underrepresented in clinical trials in everything from cardiovascular disease to cancer treatments. And in 2020, a comprehensive review published by the Journal of the American College of Cardiology found that women made up only 38% of participants in clinical trials for new cardiovascular medications, despite heart disease being the leading cause of death for women in the United States. This representation gap gets even wider when we look at pregnant people, older women, and the intersection of gender with other factors like race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status. When Black women, Hispanic women, Indigenous women, and women from other marginalized groups are systematically underrepresented in medical research, we perpetuate healthcare disparities that cost lives. And this isn't a historical footnote. It has profound consequences for healthcare delivery today. So let's talk about the textbook problem. I often talk about this idea of going beyond the textbook in medicine, and here's why. Our medical textbooks, the foundational resources that shape how physicians understand diseases, often carry these research gaps forward. When I was in medical school, I learned about typical presentations of disease, but typical often meant typical in men. Heart attacks are a classic example. We all know the symptoms, right? crushing chest pain, pain radiating down the left arm. But did you know that women often experience heart attacks very differently, including my own grandmother? Women are more likely to report unusual fatigue, sleep disturbances, shortness of breath, indigestion, anxiety, upper back pain or shoulder pain, throat pain. And many women have tragically died because both they and their healthcare providers missed these presentations that didn't match the textbook symptoms, primarily that were documented in men. And this is what happened with my grandma. She brushed off her symptoms. She waited an entire week to the point where she had a second heart attack. And it was after that that her heart was so weak that it really signaled the downturn of her eventually passing away several weeks later. Similar conditions like autism, ADHD, Parkinson's disease, all these things often present differently in women. This leads to a delayed diagnosis, 
misdiagnosis or no diagnosis of it all. I can say in my own case, I wasn't diagnosed with ADHD until I was 39. It was attributed to anxiety, but maybe anxiety plays a little bit of a piece, but primarily my symptom is essentially internal hyperactivity. Lots of thoughts going on. And it's more of lots of thoughts as opposed to perseverating and worrying about particular thoughts, which is a distinction between anxiety and ADHD. This isn't just frustrating, right? This can be life-threatening in some instances, like in the case of heart disease. Let's talk a little bit more about an area of medicine that I'm a little more familiar with, which is autoimmune disease. And really it's a gendered health care crisis. These are conditions where the immune system mistakenly attacks the body's own tissues. And this category includes conditions like rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, lupus, and Sjogren's disease, which is what I live with myself. Autoimmune diseases represent a perfect storm of gender disparity in medicine. First of all, they disproportionately affect women. About 80% of autoimmune disease patients are women. That's four out of every five patients. Yet research funding doesn't reflect the significant impact. Second, these conditions are often invisible and chronic with symptoms that fluctuate and can be difficult to measure objectively. This leads to a credibility gap where women's reports of their symptoms, of their lived experiences, are more likely to be dismissed as anxiety, as stress, as psychosomatic, right? Is it hysteria? Uh, no, it is not. Third, diagnosis then takes years, an average of 4.6 years, and seeing at least five different doctors before receiving a correct diagnosis. And during this time, damage can progress. Patients often hear this devastating phrase, your tests are normal. There's nothing wrong with you. What great news, right? But you don't feel normal. Your symptoms aren't normal. If you've been on this journey, I want you to know that I see you, I believe you, and your symptoms are real, even if they don't fit into that pretty little diagnostic box. Your lived experience matters, and you deserve healthcare professionals who listen, and even if they can't explain it, will say, I can't explain this, but I believe your lived experience. Sjogren's is a case study in underrepresentation. Let me share a little bit about disease that I am extra passionate about, both personally and professionally. Sjogren's is an autoimmune condition that overwhelmingly affects women. About nine out of every 10 patients are female. It causes the immune system to attack our parts and pieces from the tip of our head down to our toes potentially. But you know, the symptoms that we focus and are teaching around are centered around dryness in our eyes and our mouth, but it can affect virtually every organ system in our body, causing debilitating fatigue, joint pain, neuropathy, and other organ involvement. And despite affecting an estimated up to 4 million Americans, potentially as many as one out of every 100 people, Sjogren's research is significantly underfunded compared to diseases with similar prevalence and impact. And incredibly, we still do not have a single FDA-approved treatment specifically for Sjogren's disease. Not one. Patients are treated off-label with medications and or just left to manage their symptoms as best they can. Told that it's just, you know, it's the best autoimmune disease you could be diagnosed with, which is really far from the truth. I recently have been participating in the OASIS clinical trial. It's testing a promising new medication for Sjogren's disease called Dazadelopep. And this experience has highlighted both the incredible dedication of our researchers working in this field and the urgent need for more investment in and inclusion of women in medical research. Without adequate funding and representation, conditions and diseases like Sjogren's remain underdiagnosed, undertreated, and underappreciated for their significant impact on our quality of life. Including more women in clinical trials is essential, but it's really only part of the solution. We also need to address persistent biases in how healthcare professionals interpret and respond to women's health concerns. Studies have repeatedly shown that women's pain is taken less seriously than the pain of men that look and act similar to a women's situation. 
A 2021 study published in the Journal of Pain found that female patients were more likely to have their pain reports discounted and were less likely to receive pain medication compared to male patients with identical symptoms and presentation. Women are also more likely to be diagnosed with mental health conditions when presenting with a physical symptom. While mental and physical health are deeply connected for everyone, this pattern reveals a dangerous bias where women's physical symptoms are more readily attributed to a psychologic cause. True progress requires both systemic change and individual awareness. As healthcare professionals, we need to examine our own biases and practice careful, attentive listening. And as patients, we deserve healthcare professionals who take our concerns seriously and who are willing to work collaboratively and in partnership with us towards a solution. Regardless of which side of the stethoscope you're on, awareness is the first step to change. So in this Women's Health Month, I am calling on all of us to take action. First, let's champion more inclusive research. If you're eligible for clinical trials, consider participating. Go listen to my prior episodes on the thought process I went through in thinking about participating in clinical trials. Ask questions. Second, advocate for conditions that disproportionately affect women. Sjogren's, lupus, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, ME, endometriosis. These are conditions that deserve more attention, They deserve more funding and they deserve more research. And third, be an informed and empowered patient. Document your symptoms, ask questions. And if you don't feel heard, seek a second, a third, a 10th opinion. Trust your body and your own experience. And fourth, support those organizations that are working for change. From research funding to policy advocacy, many organizations are fighting to close these gaps. And last, but certainly not least, share your stories. When we speak up about our lived experiences, we help others feel less alone. We shine a light on the problems that need solving. If you are struggling to feel heard and understood on your health journey, please know that you are not alone. I'm here to help. I am licensed in, oh goodness, about 15 states now. They're all listed below. And I offer telehealth appointments through my practice, the Immune Confident Institute. If you're not located in those states, First of all, get on our wait list so that I know where you are so I can add that to my to-do list. But I also offer medical mentorships no matter where you are to really offer that support in a non-medical visit. You can also connect with others in my free Facebook groups, Becoming Immune Confident Community and the Success with Sjogren Sisterhood, which is not just limited to women, just the vibe. And finally, if you are living with Sjogren's disease, I invite you to join the wait list of our upcoming fourth annual virtual Sjogren Summit, Building Your Sjogren's Network. It is a multi-day online event dedicated to empowering you with knowledge, connection, and resources. You'll find all those links in the description below. Women's health is everyone's concern. When we improve healthcare for women, we really do improve healthcare for all. I'd love to hear from you. What does Women's Health Month mean to you? What aspects of women's health deserve more attention? How have you advocated for yourself or others in healthcare settings? Share your thoughts and your experiences in the comments below. And don't forget to subscribe for more videos like this one. Together, we can build a healthcare system that truly sees, hears, and serves everyone. Thank you for watching, and I can't wait to see you in our next video. Take care.